Praise be to the living God. We, as always, is grateful to have you join us in our study of God's holy and divine word uh, at Understanding the Father's Heart Ministries. Uh, my name is Evangelist and Teacher Joseph A. Brown. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We ask, Lord God, that you open up our eyes and up our spiritual ears that we might be able to hear what the Spirit is saying today, Father. That we might know what your will is and, Father God, what our purpose is to be in this earth even right now. With all things that's transpiring before us, Father God, we need your guidance. And so we ask for it right now in Jesus' name. Teach us, Father God, by your Spirit. We thank you and we praise you. Amen and amen. Glory be to the living God. We are truly blessed, my brothers and sisters, to be with you this day in the study of God's Word. We are living in a day and a time uh, where it is getting increasingly violent, vicious, and vile. And I say to you today that we need to have our minds and our thoughts in the right place and in the right direction. Because the enemy today is coming up with new plans and new ideas in order to trip up or cause God's own chosen people to somehow uh, walk away from Him because of not ignorance, but because of deception. There's so much deception out there in the earth today that we need to be schooled by the Spirit of God in His Word. We can't just simply go on the fact of following teachers because they make us feel good or they make us feel comfortable. But we need to know the truth because Jesus said the truth will make you free. Amen? Glory be to God. What an important thing to truly know. Last week we talked about uh, replacement theology. We said that uh, many uh, denominations today believe that they have somehow replaced the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. Well, we established the fact through the Word of God that that did not happen. But rather that God has just simply set aside the Jewish nation for a season. So that way the Gentiles would have an opportunity to come into the kingdom of God. And the word even says that he did this in order to make Israel jealous of the Gentile nations. And hopefully by that alone some will come into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as being their Savior that they are still waiting for, to let them know that He has already arrived. But what we want to focus on this day is the thought of not one is righteous. No one is righteous before God. You know, in the time that we live today, and it's the age of the Laodicean church, where the church said, look at me, I am proud, I am rich, I am boastful, so surely I must be God's chosen. But dearly beloved, just because you have things in your life does not mean you are a chosen of God. We have to get that understanding, dearly beloved, because if we don't, then we'll be just as David was at one time. He said, when I look to the other hand and I saw the riches and I saw how the children of the wicked was being blessed in some fashion, I almost slipped because I didn't recognize that what their end would be. Remember, there's an end to every story. It doesn't matter how the story began, but it does matter how it ends. And David said, when I saw their lives and the things they were prospering in, I even became envious and jealous of them. But not recognizing there is an end result 
to their life. Amen? Look at the life of Lazarus. Lazarus went through quite a bit, especially the one that he speaks about that was at the, at the table of the rich man. He ate the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. He did not participate with the family in eating, and the rich man cared nothing about giving him anything. The rich man lived sumptuously, but the Bible declares that in the end, that rich man lifted up his eyes, and he was in a cloak of fire. He had been tossed down into Guyana, hell, and yet he could not fully understand why, but he was there. And though Lazarus did not have much, now he sat in the bosom of Abraham. So dearly beloved, let's not look at the story as it is being told in this life, but let's look at it with an end result. Amen? There's an epilogue to every story. You can't just go on the fact of what is happening now. There is an ending to everything. Now, we talk about no, not one righteous, but I want us to look in Romans, uh, the book of Romans, <clears throat> the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, and we want to look at the 10th verse. It reads as this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In the previous scriptures, uh, Paul was defending himself because in the 8th verse it says, and not rather as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Paul said, no, we don't preach that you can do evil. We don't preach that you can get away with evil just because of grace. Grace is grace. But we don't have to establish ourselves in the law in order to make sure that we don't do wrong. It is the Spirit of God that is now dwelling in the believer that we can trust that we will do that which is righteous because the Spirit will never lead us wrong. And this is what Paul was establishing because the Jews were basically saying, we're following the law. We're walking in the law. So that makes us righteous. But you're saying that if you live in the grace of God, then you have an opportunity to sin. You have a license to sin. And Paul was establishing, no, I'm not saying that you have a license to sin because of grace, but I can't get away from the point that uh, it is a free gift from God. You cannot earn salvation. Salvation is a gift from Almighty God, a free gift. Not because of the works you do or not because of who you are. It is simply something that God offers to humankind. And we have a choice to receive it or not. And he was trying to establish with the Jewish people who were in the congregation. And remember, the first church was full of Jewish Christians who were still living partially in the law, hadn't pulled themselves completely from the law because that's what they had been told from their youth. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not do this. And Paul was trying to get them to see that you no longer are dependent upon the law, but now you are dependent upon grace and having faith in that grace. And there are those who were saying that Paul was teaching that you can sin and God will be okay with it because now you're covered by grace. And that's not what Paul was uh, writing <clears throat> and saying or teaching. He says in the ninth verse, what then? Are we better than they just because we walk by grace? No, in no wise. For we have before proof both Gentiles and Jews that they all are under sin. We are under sin. None of us are righteous. 
The Jews and the Gentiles are under sin. There are two people that God sees in this world. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. There are lost and there are saved people. Amen? That's all what God sees. Man sees black, they see white, they see brown, they see yellow, they see red, they see all these other things, these colors. But I want you to know, dearly beloved, our God in heaven does not see that. He does not look upon it in that way. He does not look upon it because he is not a respecter of persons as we are as human beings. When we see someone, we place judgment upon them. And we may not have heard a word come from their lips, but we are already placing judgment upon them and putting them in this little pigeonhole that we have been taught from our very youth. Well, God, our Father, doesn't do that. He sees the lost and he sees the saved. Though they be white, though they be black, red, green, or yellow, the Lord sees his children as the ones being saved. He see the others as lost and not knowing him. And if we don't have the mindset of Christ, how are we going to enter one day into that place with him? If we don't see it the way he sees it. Amen? That's the way he sees it, dearly beloved. Lost and saved. One out of the two. You are either saved or lost. I could care less about the color of your skin. It doesn't matter to me. Are you saved or are you lost? That's all what truly matters. And dearly beloved, that's how the Lord uh, sees it. And as Paul writes, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seek it after God. He says, all those who say, I follow the law and believe that the law is the way and the truth and the life, Paul writes, they don't know basically what they're talking about. They don't understand and they don't even seek after God. Because you cannot seek after God through the law. The law does not lead to God. The law does not lead to the Father. The law is simply a law. But it doesn't lead you to the Father. The only thing that leads you to the Father and calls you to be in communication with the Father is His Spirit. Amen? That's the communication that you and I have with the Father. It is through His Holy and Divine Spirit. And as Paul wrote, there is none righteous. Unless you're righteous in your own eyes, it's as filthy rags before God. Psalms 14, 3 says, they are all gone astray. They are all together become filthy. There is none that do it good. No, not one. And who are those he's talking about? Those who trust in the law? Those who trust in their own selves? And those who trust in their abilities and their own behavior. To them, that determines their relationship with the Heavenly Father. Dearly beloved, even on this earth, if it was simply my behavior that determined if I was the son of my earthly father, then I would have long been disbanded away from him because there are things that I did that I know was contrary to what my father taught me on this earth things that he said that I should do and I did not do and did it my own way well it was according to my behavior then I would have been cast aside but it wasn't according to my behavior it was according to the fact that he is the one who uh, uh, brought me forth through him and my mother becoming one and they having a relationship that brought me forth. So I am his son regardless 
of what my behavior is. But that does not mean that I am called now to walk in bad behavior simply because I know that my father's uh, uh, relationship with me will not change. I'm not called to do that. And I want you to know this, that we are the adopted sons of the father. We are not the son like some religions teach. We are not the son. Jesus is the only Son of God. We are the adopted sons of God. Amen? So remember that, dearly beloved. We are still unrighteous, even with all the righteousness we do. But it is the blood, it is the sacrifice of Christ that makes us righteous in the eyes of the Father. Amen? Glory to our God. Their throat, Paul write, is an open grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass or snakes are under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Look how Paul is describing people who decide, I'm going to make it my own way. I'm going to trust in my ability to know the Father. I'm going to trust in the law. If I keep the law, all 699 laws, if I keep all of them, then I will have performed what it takes in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then Paul described them as one who have poison under their lips and who mouth are full with cursing and bitterness and their feet are swift to shed blood. Dearly beloved, we have to understand this. There is none that understand from their intellectual wisdom. There is no one that seeks after God. No one. On our own, we don't desire to do so. But the Holy Spirit within us drives us to seek the truth. It's the Holy Spirit in you that drives you to seek after God. It is not you, yourself, and your own uh, ability. Amen? It's not in you to seek after the things of God. But it's the Holy Spirit in you that desire the things of God the living God. We just will settle for religion alone, as millions do today. They settle going to church. They settle just uh, uh, making their obligation. They settle in just giving their tithes. They settle in just giving their offerings. They settle just shaking the hands of the priests or taking sacraments. They are settled with that and believe that type of Tradition is enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And dearly beloved, according to God's word, it is not. And they will fall short of the kingdom of God. Because that wafer that they take will not open up the gates of heaven for them. I know they believe that. I know many believe that. I know many trust in that. Or even taking the bread and the wine. Or simply just going to church and making sure they uh, darken the doors of the fellowship. Believe that that's enough. And sadly to say, dearly beloved, they have not a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And it's sad because there are multitudes who are marching right into eternal damnation because of what they believe to be the truth. The word of God makes it very plain. The blind will lead the blind. And they both will fall in the ditch. It is a relationship that must be established. And that takes dedication. That takes focus. Just as in a marriage. If you want a relationship to work in marriage. You got to dedicate yourself to the other person. And the other person have to dedicate themselves to you. 
in order that that relationship lasts. Well, the Father already has established the fact that He cares about us and He loves us because the Word of God says that He sent His Son to die for us because of His love for us. And it's not us who said, well, oh, I want to love God. Oh, I, I want to fall in love with the Lord. No. It was the Lord falling in love with us and say, I want to see you saved. And right now you're hearing this message and some of you are living that life where it's just simply going to church and just simply um, giving, uh, I'm giving offering. I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing all these things in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And dearly beloved, I can say to you right now, you don't have to do any of those things and still can enter in the kingdom of heaven. And that is through your faith, that is through your belief, that is through you being born again and establishing a relationship with the heavenly father. That's the most important relationship that you will ever, ever establish. And that's knowing him. And that's why Paul wrote, I count everything as dung, everything I have learned, everything I know about, I cast it aside that I might know him. And that's what it takes. It takes for you and I to cast aside religion. All the things that we thought was true, the things that we think was right, we have to cast all that aside because we have only one desire now, and that is to know him. And to know Him is to know truly how unrighteous we really are. The closer we get to the Lord, it's like getting closer to a mirror. The more we can see the blemishes that are in our lives. The more we see our unworthiness, the closer we get to Him. So that lets me know when someone is humbled and they're a humble person, I know that they have been with the Lord. But the braggadocious, the boastful, the cocky ones who stands up there and talk about how they know the Lord and the relationship that they have with the Lord, I know that they are not seeking the Lord. Because God's presence will humble you like never before. Was it not Isaiah or Elijah who said, Oh, when he saw the glory of God, oh me, a man of unclean lips. I'm not worthy to be before the Lord even right now. Though I'm one of his choicest servants, I don't have the right to be before the Lord in this way. And dearly beloved, none of none of us. And that's why Jesus Christ said, learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. And there will be none that will enter in who have not become as a little child. You can take a little child and put them on a playground and they'll make all kinds of friends. They're not looking at the color of their skin. They're not looking at the texture of their hair. They're not looking at anything. They're enjoying themselves because that is not a part of who they are. And so that's how we have to become if we are going to understand. And I believe that the only way to get to that kind of thinking is to get to a place where we see our own blemishes, our own unrighteousness, and to know that our own do-good that we think we have done, that it is filthy rags unto of the Lord. Dearly beloved, you can do your own thing, and you can think that it is good. And even though that the people who do that, you know, they are literally walking dead and not even knowing it. They are dead before God. They're bitter and with the truth and will attack. They carry with them the law, and they're in bondage. They measure themselves to the law. I've done good. I have done all these things, so I can act 
like I want to act. I can have the behavior that I have right now and bring no changes in their life at all. For Psalms 116 says, For their feet run towards evil, and they hastily shed innocent blood. They just want to get their way. No matter how many lives are destroyed in the midst of them, they just want to take advantage and get their way. It's about being successful in their eyes. And dearly beloved, success is being directly in the will of the Father. That's true success. You look at the life of Jesus Christ, uh, and many would say, if they did not know who he was and what he represent, they would say that he was a failure because he died. And all those who followed him had forsaken him. Is that not the sign of what humankind calls failure today? When you have no one following you, and then they take you and kill you? Yes, dearly beloved. That is failure in the eyes of the world. But it's not in the eyes of Almighty God. And dearly beloved, you can only become a success when you are in God's will. And the best place to get there is to acknowledge that you are not righteous before God, but you are righteous because of what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary. Amen. Praise be to the living God. Dearly beloved, we are blessed that you continue to join us like this in our study of God's holy and divine word. And join us on Sunday morning between hours of 6 and 10 a.m. at 92.7 KZJM or www.927kzjm.org. Amen. And the Lord will bless you richly. We are actually studying in the book of Hebrews about how to rest in the Lord and how to stay rested in the Lord. Amen. And if you have any uh, correspondence that you want to do with us, uh, address it at Evangelist Joseph A. Brown, Post Office Box 186, Youngsville, Louisiana 70592. Again, that's Evangelist Joseph A. Brown, Post Office Box 186, Youngsville, Louisiana 70592. The Lord bless you in a special way. Know that we love you. Know that we pray for you. And dearly beloved, understand this. It is not the word that you know, but that which you understand that gets you the victory in Christ. Be blessed until we join you once again.